It was, yes, indeed, a, a, an um, attempt to get freedom, but I felt it was more of a blow to slavery itself. The white, didn't, the white people didn't um, see them as human. I'm thinking about it alone. You're a slave. You don't have freedom. Even though you may not be being whipped every day or so on, you still need, you still want your freedom. It's going to just be the same process every day, over and over and over and over. And eventually somebody would get tired of it. Although they were all fighting for their freedom, Cuffy's ideology was different from the field slaves. He was a brave man because he he thought of our freedoms. He wanted us to be freed, so he fought for it. What happened to Governor Van Hoogenheim? I've got a better understanding of Van Hoogenheim because I never really understood him that much. Cuffy, a forefather of emancipation. Enslaved in the Dutch colony of Berbice, Cuffey fought for an independent African state in 1763, 12 years before the American Revolution and 28 years before the Haitian Revolt. History remembers him as a visionary who inspired a people and later a nation. This is an extraordinary story of courage, humanity, and sacrifice. This is Cuffy's story. February 23rd, 1763, began like any other day in Berbice, a Dutch colony on the north coast of South America, a territory of marshland, jungle, and plantations built along the mighty Berbice and Kanje rivers in the early 17th century. 125 plantations, packed with enslaved Africans, overworked and brutalized. But by sunset, 73 Africans on Plantation Magdalenenburg had killed the plantation manager, set fire to the house, and fled towards quarantine in the eastern region of what was to become modern-day Guyana. They were soon joined by Africans from other plantations. It was the start of a major rebellion that would change the course of history in South America and the Caribbean. Four days later, the African community on the Berbice plantations of Juliana, Zealandia, Elizabeth, Alexandria and Hollandia joined the revolt. The rebels killed white settlers and ransacked houses for valuables, guns and ammunition. They torched buildings and cane fields, destroying the system that had enslaved them. But not everyone wanted to rebel. Some refused to join the revolution. A small group fled into the bush. Some remained loyal on plantations, and others escaped with their Dutch masters. News of the attacks reached Burbese governor, Wolfert Simon van Hoogenheim. The governor acted fast, sending a slave ship up the Burbese River with orders. To do all in his power to prevent the further progress of the miscreants and to crush them completely if possible in order to protect the Christians upstream and to rescue them from the hands of the raging barbarians. But it was too late. The advantage was with the newly liberated Africans, now numbering more than 2,500. Their next stop, Fort Nassau, the capital, where the surviving Dutch had taken refuge in three ships. Van Hoogenheim wrote, I found myself in a very sad and unpleasant situation, having no more than eight soldiers in service. Nonetheless, I took as much precaution as was possible not to be surprised and attacked by the rebels. Among the freedom fighters, Cuffy was the natural leader. Because of his wisdom, because of his spirituality and because of his knowledge of how the Dutch functioned, he had, he had an edge. And he became the new governor of the colony with his trusted deputy, Akara, like Cuffy and Akan from Plantation Lilienburg, and his commanders, Atta, a newcomer to Berbice, Gusari and Kosael. The languages were not so exclusive that they couldn't communicate. 
Because if the Europeans could communicate with the blacks, even brought from Africa, how much more? These people and many of the languages, which are called West African groups of languages, are interchangeable and they understand. The revolutionaries, a mix of Akans, Angolans, Congolese and Creoles who were born in the colony, headquartered at the Zealandia and Hollandia plantations. Cuffey introduced a code of discipline to the fighters and trained them in warfare with the help of captured European mercenaries. These were the very white mercenaries who were protecting the governor. When they came over, they, they, they said, destroy them. And um, Coffee said, no, he rescued them. He said, these men are useful to us. They have skills that we can, we can, we can deploy. They can repair cannon. They can teach our men um, how to repair and to service. Coffee fought a very modern war. What was modern in that period is where Coffee was at. So what he demonstrates to us is a fantastic case study. He gave them unity and a collective purpose. Everyone, men, women and children, had a role to play. Leaders, warriors, farmers. Cuffey's rebellion was gaining momentum. Agu! 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 Cuffey's story begins here, Africa the cradle of humanity. Kuffi was an Akan from West Africa. Akan states were once among the most powerful in Africa, stretching along the coastal lands of modern-day Ghana, Togo, and the Ivory Coast. They were wealthy, sophisticated monarchies with a rich culture and proud history. In Africa, history describe our political structures two ways. There's a centralized political system, which means that you have the king, the queen, the chief, and army elders, a well-organized system with a palace arrangement. And then you have the non-centralized, which has to do with not having a king, queen, or chief, but a headman and assistants. In 1415, Portuguese explorers, determined to map a faster trade route to South Asia, sailed along Africa's north and west coasts. They found tribes willing to trade in gold, ivory, and dye. Africa was well organized in terms of their own structure, political system, in terms of their economic uh, structures, trade, um, industry, gold mining, iron working, salt making, and so on. Gold was the most important, you know. That's why we're called the Gold Coast. Then ivory, and then um, what you call dye wood, wood that you can use to dye cloth. But before long, they were transporting much more. In 1441, two Portuguese captains seized 12 Africans in Cabo Branco, present-day Mauritania. Three years later, another 235 Africans were snatched and enslaved in Portugal. It was the start of Europe's enslavement of Africa. In the 16th century, the Spanish, English, Dutch and French followed suit building empires of sugar-producing colonies in the New World with the blood and sweat of Africans. This um, legal concept, which was called terra nullis, um, was the idea that Europeans could claim what they considered to be unoccupied land for their own country. And we can see obvious examples of how this was put into place in, well, throughout the Americas and also very obviously in Australia, for example. So this is an, it becomes an established pattern and there's even a, a, a legislation framework for Europeans to do this. The Dutch were gifted seafarers, merchants of a young, ambitious empire with a state-of-the-art fleet of ships. The Dutch West India Company was formed on June 3, 1621. Its mandate, to trade and to provide military services in the new Dutch colonies on the north coast of South America, Essequibo, Berbice, Suriname, and Demerara. Between 1501 and 1867, when the Dutch finally ended their slave trade, Dutch captains shipped an estimated 
555,000 captured Africans to plantations in the Americas. Colonies were useful because they provided lots of income that went back into the, the tax coffers of the state and they also provided um, key spaces in this global set of skirmishes that went on between the European countries. I think it's quite important to see the Americas as part of the outplaying, if you like, of the various European competitions between the states over markets and commodities. Across four centuries, competing European empires kidnapped some 12.5 million Africans. They were taken in horrific conditions across the Atlantic and enslaved in the Americas. What we now know as the transatlantic slave trade. Now, one of the interesting stories about Africa is that any time those who don't have the structured system are attacked, they don't have an organized army, they don't have anything, they are the worst off. So during the times of slavery, those the non-centralized were the victims of enslavement. They start with the philosophy they were really either less than human beings or a low class of human beings. A long question, question them, their, their humanity, in his book, the Edward Long, who wrote a three-volume history of Jamaica and assimilated them to animals. He has about 10 pages on them, why they should be closer to apes and orangutans than human beings. And that is what the philosophy that prevailed. The growth of the Dutch Empire depended on their maritime superiority, successful African ports, and a brutal plantation system. Modern historians have linked the harshness of slavery to the development of the plantation regime. And Cuba, for instance, serves as an example that whereas in the 18th century, because the plantation regime and certainly the sugar plantation regime was not highly developed, the conditions under which enslaved people lived were comparatively lighter with small farming, herding and so on. But in Cuba in the 19th century, as the sugar plantation regime developed, the records show that the brutalities became greater because the sugar regime demanded much greater labor and regimentation than any other form. On April 22nd, 1627, Dutch merchant Abraham Van Peer of Vlissingen founded a private colony on vast marshlands and jungle along the Berbice River, which stretched 370 miles inland. A group of 40 men and 20 boys became the colony's first European settlers, based in Nassau, about 50 miles upstream. Before long, Berbice attracted more Dutch pioneers with the promise of wealth and adventure. By the middle of the 18th century, small farms had grown into large plantations, ranging up to 500 acres. Berbice was primarily private. It was primarily private. Burbies was forever undercapitalized, forever, on, it was a backward colonial outpost. The dregs of that society came out here, right? They, 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 they were the lesser human beings that came out here. And while the numbers were small and they did not have the real imperial history of slavery, they were an unthinking group of people. They were an unthinking group of people. The territory had become home to 3,833 enslaved Africans, 244 enslaved Amerindians, and 346 Europeans. The Dutch built the striking Fort Nassau to protect their interests in the prized colony. It would remain the capital of Berbice, until 1790. The region was first spotted by Christopher Columbus in 1498, but it was almost a century before Sir Walter Raleigh's search for El Dorado sparked real interest in the Guyanas. Dutch explorers were among the first who came. 
scouting the rugged coastline at the end of the 16th century and trading with indigenous Amerindian tribes, such as the Caribs, Akawas, and the Arawaks. Within a few decades, as the colonies were established, these Amerindians were enslaved on plantations. But many could not survive the strain of a brutal work regime, physical abuse, and European diseases such as smallpox. The short-term effects of the invasion were clearly catastrophic for Amerindians who were exposed to all kinds of diseases that they had no immunity to, and that in fact wiped people out much more effectively than being sent to work in mines and other very difficult working conditions. So you can see that within a hundred years, the um, Amerindian populations of what's now Central and South America have been decimated. Several Amerindian tribes were granted free nation status and African captives replaced them on the plantations. Cuffey was among them and he spent most of his life on a plantation called Lillianburg on the banks of the Kanje River, a large tributary of the Berbice River. There was a strict social order on the plantations. At the top were white owners or managers, followed by other white employees, such as overseers. Among the enslaved Africans, skilled craftsmen and house servants were ranked above the field gangs. At the head of the field gangs were drivers, men and women who whipped undernourished Africans to maximize production. Every aspect of plantation life was built on this principle of optimum production. Cruelty went unchecked. The enslaved were flogged, hanged, mutilated, broken at the wheel and burnt. African women were routinely raped by the ruling classes. Cuffy was a cooper. This put him at the top of the plantation order of Africans, in a position envied by the harshly treated field gangs. But Cuffy also commanded the respect of many and he shared their dream of freedom. Although he was not in the field, his days were long and hard, crafting wooden casks to hold sugar and gunpowder. The same rules, punishments, and cruelty applied to all Africans on the plantations. And this cruelty was sowing the seeds of rebellion. In 1712, Plantations and forts were badly damaged by French buccaneers who laid siege to the colony. The Van Peer family refused to pay the full ransom demanded by the French government. And in late 1714, five Amsterdam merchants stepped in to settle the debt. Berbice had new owners. They always had problems in, in financing the administration. I'm not talking about feeding slaves or maintaining the pension. They have problems merely existing, merely existing. So you have this whole stretch of private plantations here and all of them struggling, all of them. Struggling. When a pirate came in and raided the, um, the colony, the several estates took away the sugar, took away the slaves. They had the devil's own job in resuscitating the economy. Um, the plantation would be in debt to the buccaneer for 20, 30 years. And then they'd have to go and, you know, <laughs> do all sorts of shenanigans to recapitalize the enterprise. So, I mean, it was a case where, like Demerara, it was a prosperous, the, 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 the growth was robust or anything. For the greater part of the time, the Dutch were in their peace. They were poor people. On October 24th, 1720, the Society of Burbese, responsible for the colony's administration and investment, was established. Burbese started to show promise and it was promoted in the Netherlands as an attractive place to migrate. But by 1760, with the arrival of Governor Wolfert van Hugenheim, conditions had deteriorated. The territory was in chaos, ravaged by an epidemic of suspected dysentery 
which had claimed the life of the previous governor. The Europeans suffered the greatest losses, including several council officials, estate managers, and dozens of soldiers. Berbice was vulnerable. You had a lot of uh, disease, which was killing out the white, particularly. Um, the white soldiers that had to protect Kanji were on the decline. I think at one point it was suggested that it was 1 to 12. As the epidemic continued into 1762, the Dutch started to fear that the enslaved Africans would revolt. The African community was forced to work harder and treated even more savagely by the distressed colonists. And before long, the Africans started to plot a path to revenge and freedom. Bad news poured in from every corner of the colony. By March 3rd, 1763, the Kanje freedom fighters had reached quarantine. The first bloody battle between the Africans and the Dutch took place on Plantation Pier Boom, led by Kossael. Van Hugenheim wrote, This morning I received a message signed by Mr. George and Subi, written from the Plantation Pier Boom, informing me in substance that they were gathered there with the women and children and all about 40 Christians, that the runaways had made their way up to the Plantation Prosperiteit next to them, that they were in great fear and anxiety, yet that they still retained some hope awaiting their salvation soon with the arrival of the slave ship, which they trust was already on the way. I answered this message, which was brought by a free Indian immediately, using the same messenger, admonishing them to keep up their courage, that the ship was on its way, and that I hoped that in everything God would grant a good outcome. At Plantation Pier Boom, the Dutch, low on ammunition and stranded, negotiated with Kossael, so that they could travel to Fort Nassau unharmed. But as the group made their way to the river, Kossael and his fighters opened fire. The majority of the fleeing Dutch were killed. A few escaped by jumping into the river. Others were later executed or forced to work in the fields. The daughter of Captain George, a Dutch officer, became Cuffey's wife. It was clear that the Dutch were militarily and psychologically unprepared to deal with a rebellion of this scale. Morale was low at Fort Nassau. Many wanted to abandon the colony. Some fled to neighbouring Demerara. But Governor Van Hugenheim wanted to defend the territory. Cuffey sensed an opportunity, the chance to establish an independent African state in the heart of Europe's colonies. He sent the first of eight letters to Van Hugenheim, demanding that every European should leave the colony. He identified the cruelty inflicted by the white classes as the reason for the revolution. The letters were written by captive Europeans and Prince, an educated African. Cuffey, like many other captives, was unable to read or write. The small Dutch contingent, many now ill, abandoned Fort Nassau. Burning buildings and spiking cannons, they moved to St Andrew's Fort at the confluence of the Burbies and Kanje rivers, against Van Hugenheim's advice. The fort had no running water, no farmable land, and no proper defences. Nearly always weak. Their fort were nearly always in poor state of upkeep. The military was always dissatisfied. They were always poorly, nearly always poorly armed. And they were of the worst discipline. Like I said, only the dregs came here. Right? And uh, they had these little skirmishes. And whenever they came up, the guys always preferred not to notice, not to be aware. The military, that is, didn't want to be aware that there was a revolt on Plantation A or Plantation B, right? And mutiny was 
not an everyday, but it was not an uncommon occurrence among the Dutch. So they were not properly organized. They, they, they were better disorganized. A desperate Van Hugenheim sent a small group of enslaved Africans and Amerindians to seek help from Suriname, Essequibo, and Demerara. Recognizing the implications of a successful rebellion in Berbice, Essequibo Demerara Director General Lawrence Storm Van Gravesande instructed the commander of Demerara to ask for assistance from the Amerindian Free Nations. He then requested military reinforcements from the Netherlands and St. Eustatius, and all able-bodied men in Berbice and Essequibo were ordered to remain in the colony while women and children were moved to safety. In Suriname, officials banned any talk of the rebellion next door. The governor had other governors that he, he was relating to that new slave rebellion, Demerara had, Essequibo had. And so they had already recognized, and there were cases before, where they had to come to the assistance of each other. A slave rebellion in any one area will send a bad signal in the other areas. On March 17th, 1763, Van Hugenheim wrote, I saw myself in the most unpleasant and precarious circumstances ever imaginable. At the outer boundary of this unfortunate colony, in a desolate savannah, without hope for any help or rescue, with scanty provisions and many mouths to feed, the majority of which, moreover, were unwilling regarding everything. It was the moment Cuffy and his rebels could have secured victory and their dream of an independent state had they only known the extent of this Dutch desperation. Cuffy should have known that the Dutch were on their knees because within the first two or three weeks, the insurgents had captured the main fort up River in Fort Nassau. He must have sent out scouts and so on. There must have been uh, enslaved persons lower down the river who would have reported back to him. So all of those things suggest that he would have known what the situation was. Why he did not push them out remains a mystery, which hopefully someday when we explore all of the records, known or known at the moment, we will be able to offer a better answer. But the moment had passed. On March 28th, help finally arrived from Suriname. 100 soldiers sent on an English ship. Despite intense competition among the European empires, they aided each other in times of crisis reinforcing the system of oppression. On board three ships, Van Hugenheim and two dozen soldiers sailed to Dagarad, an estate with good defences, 10 miles from Fort Nassau. They launched their first offensive. Awaiting them were between 300 and 400 Africans, led by Cuffey's deputy, Akara. The two groups exchanged heavy fire with cannons and rifles for hours. Then Akara was forced to retreat. Van Hugenheim wrote, The rebels lost 10 to 12 men whom we saw carried away. There were many unarmed Negroes who dragged away the dead and wounded. It was the revolutionary's first defeat. The momentum was changing. Worse still, Akara's stand had not been sanctioned by Cuffey. This was a man, an African man, who defied every pseudo-academic myth fostered upon African people. He demonstrated a capacity for planning, for administration, for negotiation, and for subtlety in recognizing that the, the institutions to support warfare must be in place. According to surviving Dutch captives, Cuffey had instead 
been working on a strategy to lead one major attack to capture one of the cannon ships docked at Dagarad. Seizing such a ship could have given the rebels the upper hand in their fight for freedom. Now, following Akara's shock retreat, Cuffy was forced to change tactics. Eager to achieve a lasting independence for Africans in Berbice, he chose to negotiate a peace treaty. Cuffy wrote to Governor Van Hugenheim. The letter was dated a day earlier. Cuffy, Governor of the Negroes of Berbice, and Captain Akura send greetings and inform Your Excellency that they seek no war. But if Your Excellency wants war, the Negroes are likewise ready. Baki and his servant, De Graf, Shuk, Del, Valetzing, and Frederick Beckin, but more especially Mr. Baki and his servant, and De Graf are the principal originators of the riot which occurred in Berbice. The governor was present when it commenced and was very angry at it. The governor of Berbice asks your excellency that your excellency will come and speak with him. Don't be afraid, but if you wouldn't come, we will fight as long as one Christian remains in Berbice. The governor will give your excellency one half of Berbice and all the Negroes will go high up the river. But don't think they will remain slaves. Those Negroes that your excellency has on the ships, they can remain slaves. The governor greets your excellency. To buy time, Van Hugenheim responded that he would send the partition proposal to Holland for a decision. But the Dutch had no intention of bargaining with Cuffey. He um, recognized that he had limitations in waging an all-scale warfare with the Dutch. So he began to, to, um, to engage in a, a, a period of negotiations. Things were looking up for the Dutch in early April. Two armed barks arrived from St. Eustatius with 154 men. Still determined to negotiate for freedom, Cuffey wrote to Governor Van Hugenheim. Again, he proposed a meeting with the governor. I think many of the, the, the historians that um, narrated him or, or, or presented him to us um, fell short of because some of the criticisms that came about Coffee is that he allowed uh, Van Hugenheim to outsmart him by en getting into negotiations. That wasn't entirely true. Coffee's behavior was governed not by Coffee um, aspiring to power, but by Coffee aspiring to liberation and recreating what he knew as an African. It's an inherent African thing. We always carried a vision beyond ourselves, beyond our time, beyond our generation. It's an old age African concept. If I don't become king, my son, grandson, or somebody in my blood will become king. It's the same idea. Unknown to Cuffey, however, the messengers also told Van Hugenheim that there were signs of a split in the rebel command. A lot of Kofi's resistance didn't come really from the Dutch alone. They came from his own people. Weaklings, Quislings, informers, torn coats, weak hearts, traitors. People who didn't want to take up the role of being free and felt like Massa again should be in charge because now they got to fight for themselves, feed themselves, house themselves. There's also a responsibility now. Finally, on May 13th, Cuffey had had enough. He chose to take the fight to Van Hugenheim, organizing a second attack on Dagarad. More than 2,000 Africans opened fire on the plantation mid-morning, but the three Dutch ships maintained steady fire for five hours, pushing Cuffey and his fighters back into the bushes by mid-afternoon. Van Hugenheim wrote, 
We lost only one man and had only ten wounded, of whom two were gravely wounded. However, it must be considerable. On the battlefield we found eight bodies with weapons. I ordered for the heads to be impaled on a stake at the water's edge, and that the remains been burned. From all the preparation it was clear that they had gathered the whole force to exterminate us in one blow. The arrival of the two barks from St. Eustatius probably saved us. It was to be the fateful blow to Cuffey's leadership. Many of his men questioned the decision to correspond at all with the governor, and then his delayed use of force. By late May, reports of the rebellion had reached the directors of the colony in the Netherlands. They immediately dispatched two ships with 50 soldiers, three armed naval vessels with 56 guns and 410 men, and a further five ships with 600 men were sent by the Dutch State General. It was the largest military force dispatched to a Dutch colony. Coffee didn't understand that Europeans saw their colonies as arteries to survival. Their view was that you have to keep them under greater oppression, which did not call oppression, but control. And this was the problem for the British at the time of abolition. The argument was that if we give them their freedom, they will mash up everything on which they lay their hands. It will be chaos, it will be anarchy. His position now increasingly weakened by infighting. Cuffey wrote to the governor with one more offer of compromise. The Africans would retain just four plantations, Savanet, Marquee, Oostberg and Pierboom. Still Van Hugenheim made no commitment. He continued to play a waiting game. He had heard of the breakdown in Cuffey's camp. Cuffey's last known letter was sent on August 7th, 1763. When the Maroons in Africa, when the Maroons in Jamaica, right, before, achieved freedom, they negotiated their freedom. They negotiated their freedom. Which tells me that they had a real sense of the proper disposition of power. Okay? They realized that, look, I can be free for one day, but unless I have a proper relationship, that freedom can always be taken. So they negotiated. And the terms of the negotiation were not sterling. All right? They became, in a sense, military keepers of the oppressive plantation system. They entered into that arrangement to preserve their freedom. Okay? The same in Suriname. The same in Suriname. They negotiated their freedom. They fought. Right? Prove that they were a force to be reckoned with and then says, here, let us talk. And it worked in those two areas. Okay. It didn't work in Guyana. It didn't work in Guyana. Why did it not work in Guyana? Perhaps Guyana had too many persons contesting for leadership. It's a possibility. No one has studied it. No one knows. But the, the notion that coffee failed because, 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 I mean, there's much more study to be done before one can begin to be judgmental. If coffee had taken a different approach to revolutionary warfare, um, it, the results would have been different, but that would have meant a lot more deaths and coffee was humane. But the situation was also desperate for Van Hugenheim. The epidemic had reduced his fighting force to just 42 men. His fellow colonists were worried, questioning his decisions and fearing for their safety. Both camps were in turmoil. Cuffey faced widespread indiscipline. The freedom fighters were divided between those born in the colony and those born in Africa. What happens on a plantation is not only do you have assimilated 
and unassimilated Africans. But you also have the ethnic divisions. And we had all of these groups of people there, and they were all watching. They all wanted to be free. They all wanted to be free. And uh, the colony had to survive. So some had to plow and some had to shoot. Who would shoot and who would plow? You have seen this conflict. Some were saying, become, go to Maroonage, become Maroons, destroy everything, loot what we have to take and head for the jungle, for the bush. Coffee's principle was no. We make Barbies a state, our state. We were, the, coffee was going for statehood, not encampments in the bush, but st a statehood that could trade and defend itself. With food and ammunition running low, Several freedom fighters wanted to flee the colony and form a maroon community. They were in a system. The system was the only thing they know. People have the tendency to want to be sure. And the slightest sign of insecurity causes them to move to what they perceive to be security, however bad it is defined. It might well have been because of the great isolation of the plantations in Barbies. They were so isolated that, that enslaved people could hardly interact with each other. They had to get to various places by the use of canoes, right? Each plantation was more completely a world in itself than say in Jamaica or in Martinique or Guadeloupe. And that isolation must have played a part in preventing them for, from interacting in the way they should have. So that when they came together for the first time, it is possible that they did, really did not know much of each other and so forth and so on. There was not the, that kind of fusion as one might have anticipated. Conditions got worse. The Africans ate horses, cats and dogs to survive. You cannot wage war and for those who have studied warfare, when your people are hungry, um, as in other areas of, of, of conflict, if we examine them, populations turned to, resorted to cannibalism, etc., because of shortage of food. An army travels on its belly. You gotta feed people. And if Coffee was having a hard time putting people back to, 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 to creating food. Um, he would have had a very difficult time waging. It, it would have fragmented as it did eventually. You had to deal with everyday administration, having to function as a leader without resources can put a toll on your ability to govern. In October, their leadership splintered as Akara, Cuffey's deputy, and Atta challenged their African governor. Cuffey, who had brought the rebels so far in their fight for freedom, lost the leadership. Stripped of his power and position, he killed himself. At the outset, I wouldn't say in fighting for leadership, I would say of strategy, which after the, which in late August reached the head as a struggle for leadership, in which Atta deposed uh, Coffey by a popular vote. That is what the literature is telling us, that he lost on a vote. And that has come from evidence apparently based upon uh, some of the insurgents who were taken and before the trial question. He was buried with full chief rights. Two white captives sacrificed on his grave as an offering. It could have been different if Kofi had been more uh, forceful, more autocratic and even dictatorial. But Kofi was a more civilized person and his civility 
is what causes demise or his defeat in the end. He dared to dream bigger than himself. In that sense, Coffee lives on. The idea, the concept that as inimical as your surroundings or circumstances uh, are, you can dare to dream bigger than yourself. An older freedom fighter called Boy was briefly made governor in chief, but he failed to unite the camp. Boy stepped down and Atta became the new leader. But the disagreements remained and the camp split along tribal lines. At the Essendam plantation, Atta fought other senior rebels, including Kosael and Akara. Atta emerged victorious, but the rebel movement would never fully recover. Atta is said to have arrived, and I believe it's true, in the colony a year or so before the rebellion. So he would not really have gained the general consensus for a following. We do not know why he became so prominent and deputy leader to Coffey, but maybe people learned of his military skills. He was Akan, and the Akan in West Africa were reputed as being among the great fighters in the building of the great Ashanti Empire. Five armed ships arrived from the Netherlands and buffers were established along the Quarantine, Upper Demerara and Berbice rivers to prevent Atta's force from leaving the colony. In November, the Dutch recaptured several estates along the Kanje and Berbice rivers. Free Africans in the Kanje and Berbice burnt buildings and equipment before fleeing into the bushes. But they were no match for the Dutch and they surrendered in large numbers. Gusari, Atta's former commander, and Akara struck a deal with the Dutch, their lives in return for the capture of Atta and his men. He was able to buy time. By buy time, he was able to replenish his forces, and, and he was able to reclaim the country, he was able to reclaim the, the colony. Coffee could have sent him packing, Right, kill them, destroy them, but you would have still had the problem of maintaining order within the society for the simple reason that his leadership is questioned. On January 1st, 1764, six ships carrying 600 men from Europe reached Berbice. The Dutch settlers were saved. On the anniversary of the rebellion, only two revolutionary leaders remained free, Atta and Akabre. Akabre led a maroon camp of 600, while Atta commanded around 1,500 rebels. There was no gunpowder. They were eating the cattle. They had, it said they had virtually eaten all the animals, even their horses. The plantation was not in production. What could you do? You either you could either do like Atta did and go into Marumi Maroon encampments and build there as they might have known of the Suriname Maroons, but you have to create a life for yourself and at least in the short term eat eat from the wildlife of the the jungle, or you make your peace with the plantation owners and hope for a better deal. Your choice became limited limited for the vast majority of people who could not survive in the forest because maroon life was at least as harsh as plantation life but with the difference you're not being with you're struggling but you're achieving your freedom in the short term and you're building a society according to the values that you have so you are more willing to suffer that and many people were unable to do that because of the harsh conditions of the Ghana jungle. And remember the Amerindians were out there too, to mop up strays, so to speak. On March 26th, a force of more than 100 heavily armed soldiers captured a cabre. A defiant Atta and his men clashed three more times with the Dutch military, killing a number of servicemen. 
at the time when Atta and those guys would have taken over, conditions would have changed dramat dramatically, drastically, both in terms of, 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 of supplies, in terms of morale, in terms of their ability to move easily in the terrain. But the last standing rebel leader was finally betrayed, captured by Gusari and Akara after an Amerindian disclosed his location to the Dutch. Almost certainly, in the aftermath of the revolt, a number of persons in Barbies became Maroons and they joined sometimes with the Maroons in the neighboring colony of Demerara immediately to the west. And by the early 19th century, they had become so large that they were giving a lot of trouble to the British to ferret them out. The Dutch wanted revenge. Freedom fighters were interrogated, brutally punished, and placed on show trials. More than 120 Africans were sentenced to death. Atta and the other surviving leaders faced the worst punishment. Pieces of Atta's flesh were torn from his body with a hot pincher before he was burnt at the stake. Cuffey's successor heroically endured the suffering of his final hours with honor and dignity. So disturbed by the number of executions and the sadistic nature of his fellow Dutchmen, Van Hugenheim wrote to the colony directors in Holland, asking for mercy. The pardons arrived on December 15th. It was too late for many. But 16 Africans who had remained loyal to the Dutch were freed. It seems as though he was genuinely uh, out of favor with the brutalities that planters meted out to their charges. And he was not unique in this. Many officials in the various West Indian colonies commented on these brutalities, but were unable to help. Cuffey and his revolutionaries, the forefathers of emancipation, had been free and in charge of the colony for just 10 months. But it was long enough to sow the seeds of a liberation movement that would help to bring about the end of the transatlantic slave trade, the abolition of slavery, and to inspire the fight for independence across the colonies. Well, my father taught his children. He said to us, if you don't know your own story, you'll be perpetuating someone else's story. And so the question is, if we don't know our story, we will carry other people's stories and spread it and sink root for them. We are, in fact, products of history, but we, have ten we tend to disassociate ourselves from the basics of what has gotten us to this point. Thus, you find us redressing back to a form of modern day slavery where the shackles have been removed from our hands and feet and placed on our mind. But I don't believe that the curriculum did a wonderful job or they were effective in disseminating the contributions that Coffee made to our independence. I think it was just a monument that we observed, more or less, rather than information that will challenge us to be more mindful of the freedom that we enjoyed. The location of his grave is still unknown, but his courage and vision live on. On February 23rd, 1970, Cuffey was honored as Guyana's only national hero. When you look 1763, Kofi and others in Guyana, and you look at uh, 80, 20, 20 years later, one of the differences would have been that the 1763 rebellion became a, a teaching rebellion. It was something for other rebellions down the line to look at and learn, both from the good points and the bad points. Everything was against that slave African, everything. He was chattel, he was old, he did not have a right, okay? 
and people like Coffee stood up and said, I need to be free. He didn't just say it, he went out and fought for it. And today we sit down and we said, can you give me, please, can I have, can you give me, and that, that's all we do. That's all we do, and you ask, where is that steel, that backbone, that was so evident in 1839? There is no debate that um, Kofi was ahead of his time. Personally, within spirit, Kofi lives. Atta lives. Akara lives. Akabre lives. And that's why the revolutionary lives. The revolution lives 250 years later. Here we are. Here I am speaking in the voice of my ancestor. Because the revolution has not ended. The Burby Surprising still continues.